morning and let me be the first to say happy Star Wars Day or may the fourth be with you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and uh, we're very pleased this morning at the University of Louisville to have uh, a wonderful, uh, insightful lecture coming up. Uh, Dr. Jose Bourdon, uh, who is an assistant clinical professor at Washington University Medical School and Washington Health Institute. And he'll be talking about uh, HIV infection and how this field is evolving. But to, to do the proper introdu introduction, I'm gonna ask Dr. Forrest Arnold, professor in the Department of Internal Medicine, my division chief in infectious disease to give the, uh, to start us off. Thank you. I'm introducing my friend, Jose Bordon this morning. He went to medical school at the University of Cordoba in Argentina and got his PhD from University Autonoma of Barcelona in Spain and then was here in our division in 1996 and 97, where he was a researcher. And that served as a catalyst to doing a residency in internal medicine at George Washington University and Providence Hospital. And he followed that with an infectious diseases fellowship at the University of Maryland. Currently, he's the CEO of Washington Health Institute and a clinical assistant professor at George Washington University in Washington, DC. His research interests have evolved around several topics, one of which is HIV. Others are pneumonia, tuberculosis, antimicrobial stewardship, and hepatitis C um, virus signaling. So please welcome Dr. Bordone, and I really look forward to hearing from you. Well, thank you, Dr. Arnold uh, and Dr. Williams and the rest of the, the group. Uh, by the way, uh, good morning. I'm very delighted to share this uh, beautiful morning of a springtime. Uh, so I, I, we have a 43 uh, grades Fahrenheit here and I'm thinking that you are pretty much the same there. So let's enjoy the weather as well. So <clears throat> Dr. Arnold asked me to talk a little bit about the changes of the management of HIV. And for sure, uh, this is something that uh, we are good at here in, in Washington, DC. Uh, uh, Jason, can you, uh, there, there is, can, you, can you confirm that you can see well there the screen? Yes, we can see it and the, and the mouse too. Okay, very good, thank you. So the, the objectives for this presentation will be to review the epidemiology uh, nationwide, uh, state and local of the HIV epidemic, and also to emphasize uh, the role of the HIV testing uh, as a tool to control the epidemic. And uh, I would like to review also that uh, the HIV treatment that we call antiretroviral therapy uh, has the goal to make the virus undetectable. And this is with the end to uh, accomplish healthy lives and the prevention of the epidemic. And also uh, to go over PrEP, that is uh, an intervention to prevent the spread of the to prevent the infection and the spread of, of the epidemic. Um, just to frame the, the talk and to be sure that, you know, I, we see the picture from the same angle as possible, because the picture you can see from different angles and the view or the interpretation could be a, a little bit different. So I, I just wanted to frame and invite you to see from this per perspective under these key concepts. One is that HIV, the HIV infection is preventable. It's an understatement, but it's a concept that we need to remember that. Uh, also that a large segment of the population is at risk. I would say that there is no distinction for the type of you know, social determinant of health, whether you have high education or, or whatever education, income or not. However, this virus affects mostly those from minority populations. And we'll go over this. And 
this is what we also call uh, social determinant of health and risk behaviors. Uh, so uh, there are people that are suffering from social determinant of health. However, has uh, minimal risk behaviors or has optimal risk behaviors. So that's, that's a good thing. And the last one is that the current treatment of, of HIV today is very effective. I just uh, learned from Dr. Williams, uh, his experience, and we were talking briefly how bad was the HIV uh, treatment or no treatment in the very early days. Today is a different, different situation. The, effective, the treatment is very effective. However, is not curable, unfortunately. This is a, an illustration to help you to understand how effective is the treatment. And this was done, I would say, in the very early 2000, about 20 years ago. So we are uh, having this good opportunity to, to use this very effective treatment. You can see this individual suffering on the left and who someone will say, there is no way that this person will get better. There is no way that this person, that we can do something or there is no way that we can provide or we can make him you know, healthier. And those concepts are completely wrong. There, are, there is a way to make this individual healthy and to bring him back to be not just healthy, but also independent. And this is one of my goals. My goal is not just to make people healthy, but empower them to be independent and to be productive. So in that way, our community will get stronger and we can evolve in the best way possible. But I want to highlight about the, 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 the bad thing of this epidemic uh, from a longitudinal perspective. You see here in this uh, X and Y, you have the deaths for 100,000 population. And let's take a, a segment of the time from 87 to 2000. And you see many flat lines, means that those, you know, type of deaths, like, you know, chronic liver disease and heart disease and cancer didn't change much. And there is one that is quite dynamic that goes up very quickly. And there is, is a peak of the hill and then goes down probably faster that it went up. And this is what we do. And if physicians, we physicians should be very proud of the good things that we do. We bring health, we save lives, thanks to science, thanks to our good practices. So you can see that uh, this was mostly uh, mortality for people, young people, 25 to 44. Uh, I can tell you that, yes, it's bad, still bad to have this mortality in the 10 uh, uh, deaths per 100,000 population, but no doubt that there is a huge difference to bring, you know, uh, three times less, probably of four, uh, from, from the peak. Um, one thing that uh, I want to share with you is that knowledge is power. I didn't, uh, this is not my phrase, it's from Francis, Francis Bacon and comes from the 1600, long time. And we shouldn't forget that. So when we <clears throat> review the cases uh, of HIV diagnosed in 2019, uh, or, or the, the total population, uh, with HIV infection was 1.2 million people, 
Okay, that's that's a lot. However, only 87% of them, they knew that they have the infection. You may say, this is a big number, 87%, are they aware of this? This is not a big number. Uh, the goal is that 100% of them should be aware that they have the HIV infection. And this is in part because of many, many factors uh, that get together that prevent this uh, knowledge. One of them is a stigma. Uh, the other is fear. Fear makes us to avoid to do our job as it should be in many, many cases. So 13% of our people with HIV are there and they don't know that they have the infection. But I want to add here that we have a lot of work to do. We, the physicians, we are leaders and we have uh, the role to guide our population, to tell them that it's better to have the knowledge of uh, the HIV status. Not everyone who is tested will have the test positive. And it's good to know that the test is negative. And it's not good news to know that the test is positive, but it's better to have the knowledge than to have the ignorance was the HIV status, because that will help us to intervene and transform that life or, or make that life safe and healthy. Uh, in relation to the new cases, if we take <clears throat> the new cases of patients with HIV in 2020 in the US, we saw that there were about 30,000 people and there was a decline of those newly diagnosed uh, people with HIV of 8% from 2016 to 2019. And, and this is another accomplishment. It means that we are doing something good. How good it is, uh, we'll talk about that in relation to the magnitude of this good news but it's still good. Celebrate what you get, it's something good. Uh, unfortunately, the MSM accounts for 68% of those with new diagnosis in the US. And the US is and similarly in many other countries. Now, keep in mind that MSM account for about 2% of the US population. So this is, if you put that in a pie, you will have a thin slide that will be 2% MSM population. Now you put another pie that is the US population with HIV. And the slide for MSM from thin, from 2% thin will get into almost two thirds of the pie. So this is uh, amazing in the sense of uh, how bad is this community uh, suffering? And they are making a lot of progress, uh, but I think that there are, we have a lot of work to do. We have to come with honest uh, discussions, <clears throat> uh, to listen to each other, how we can do this all together. So the enemy is the virus because if we don't control the virus, we'll lose lives. We'll lose uh, uh, family members, we'll lose uh, uh, brothers and sisters and so on. So let's get together and talk more about how we can prevent HIV. Uh, in relation to who are those that are suffering the most and uh, in taken in consideration the racial background, uh, African-Americans account for 42% of those newly diagnosed. Uh, when they are in the, uh, the African-Americans uh, are about 
17 percent, 13 to 17 percent of the U.S. population. But when you take uh, the the population of patients with HIV, they 17 percent becomes 42 percent. So it's about three times higher. Uh, second, the second minority is the uh, Hispanic, Latino, and then the white uh, or Caucasians. Where is this the 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 HIV epidemic uh, the most? Where is uh, located geographically? And if we divide the U.S. map in four regions, 50%, half of the epidemic is in the South. And I think that this is another point for discussion, why the epidemic is more in one, one region out of these four regions. So why is half of this epidemic there? Uh, there are many factors there and we'll discuss and, and I, I will keep that for, for the Q&A. And now let's take the map uh, by different states and take a look. So you have here the rates of HIV diagnosis per 100,000 people. And the lighter, the better that you see here is about less than 10 per 100,000. And the darker is the worse. And clearly the map shows you that it's darker in the south. And I'm, I'm in DC. And if you see all these numbers, uh, we are on the top. So, uh, we have to do more work here. Now, uh, I would say that DC is a metropolitan area. Therefore, we shouldn't say that DC population is the same like the Montana population here. Is, is, we are not comparing apples with apples. But this is in some way an excuse. Uh, half true what I'm saying but it is uh, it's something that we can discuss more. Let's go over uh, your state. And I believe that uh, Kentucky is in the light area. So it's, it's okay, it's good. Uh, so it's one of the top in, in relation to the epidemic uh, uh, fading. Let's take a look here. The, uh, the epidemic in Kentucky. So what we have here is the area development districts and also the, this is the number of uh, cases per 100,000 and the different, uh, the, you have the, the time here in years uh, from 2016 to 2021. And you see the total cases over time, uh, it was in the 300, 340, uh, and 350. Now, I squared here in red uh, the Louisville area. And you see that the, the trend is, or the cases and trend is kind of stable in 2016 to 2020 probably, or even it was declining here. But here uh, is 189. So went up, I would say significantly, significantly. And I, I, I understand that there were other numbers that was even 192 cases. Uh, let's say, you know, two, two or three cases more, it's not a big, big change, but, uh, what I'm indicating, and you may be very aware uh, that those numbers in, in your area, but I just wanted to bring this for the discussion of today. Um, so this is, uh, let me see if I can move to the next one. Oh. So this is a interview that they did to Dr. Edward Strother, 
uh, from the University of Louisville's 550 clinic that they are doing a terrific job. And this was done in 500 and 220. So it's kind of probably, I believe that this was done before the epidemic, but was dated 220. So there are about 18,000, I'm sorry, 10,000 Kentuckians with HIV. And the distribution based on the racial background is 55 white and 25% uh, black. Now, this is uh, the distribution for the HIV epidemic. Now, the, the demographic distribution of the population is 87 white and 8% African-Americans. So this number increased by three. And why is this? Well, again, this is a epidemic that affects in relation to social determinant of health. And we need to talk more about this uh, with our friends, family. And I can tell you that words have power. And it's one of the tools that we, the physicians, we have to use more and more. If you make a comment, I can tell you that even one of the person that hear you repeat in the, in, in the community, this is a positive thing. I believe that more than one of those that you tell them, you know, we need to do the test. We at least one once a year or when there is indicated. So uh, I, I um, encourage you, uh, you uh, physicians uh, to uh, keep spreading the voice how important it is to do the HIV testing. And comes to, to the point that we have to say, uh, let's get together and work to eliminate this epidemic. We did many, many things together that we were able to defeat. And again, I am saying together, okay? We have to do this work, all of us, all the physicians with everyone from the community. So if you see how bad was the epidemic in the early, on the mid eighties, I would say, there were about 130,000 new cases with HIV infection. That was a, a nightmare. So uh, that was a time that people have those, you know, uh, not the knowledge and were kind of lost, you know, what to do. And obviously there were many factors. Condom uh, was not, uh, Consider much. Uh, the IV drugs were, you know, very much uh, used uh, for, by a, a segment of the population, and on and on. So we started this discussion that the use of condom, the use of you know avoid sharing needles, and the treatment started there. The antiretroviral therapy help. So this. New cases from 130,000 dropped to 30,000 in, 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 in 2019. Now, the goal to eliminate the epidemic is to decrease even more these numbers. And I believe that we can do it. We can do it if we get all together. Okay. And we'll decrease this number from 30,000 in 2018 to 9,300 in 2025, next year. Oh no, in two years from now. So what it tell us is telling us that today, any single case that we see a patient that we is sexually active, we should ask if he had the HIV test done ever or after an exposure. And if not, that individual should be offered to be tested. And we should insist 
you know, with the best manners possible to promote that that individual should be tested. It's no good practice that an individual was seen by a physician once, twice, and more than that, and never been offered to be tested. And then we found out that that individual was admitted in the hospital and is very sick. And I've, I've seen that many times. So that's not good. So uh, let's take a look from that perspective as well. And we are planning to put this number even lower in 2030. Uh, that number will be 3,000 individuals in 2030. And again, uh, knowledge is very important, as we said. If we say, divide this, the people who know who know the, that they or the HIV status, about 83% they know, and we said before 17, depending on the source, it, this could be 15% are unaware of the infection. Okay. So, what's the big deal of this? The big deal is that these 15% of individuals are more open and they don't pay attention and they don't use preventive measures and they are the main source of the new infection. So, uh, if we make this 15% aware of the infection, uh, I would say that we'll have new, uh, fewer uh, cases with HIV infection. Another core, core concept is that the U equal U that has been for a few years, and this is based on science. The science tell us that if the virus is undetectable, it means if the viral load is suppressed, okay, 200 is the cutoff, but you, we can go even below that, but at least 200. If the virus is undetectable, is untransmissible by sex. And this is based on the HPTN 052 study, and we are talking about transmission uh, in heterosexual couple, but also we have many other studies supporting the same. In the case of the transmission in the MSM uh, couples, we have at least two great study, the partner and opposites attract that support the U equal U concept. So who, according to the C CDC, who should be uh, tested or how should be the testing done. So uh, anybody who is 13 years old to 64 should have one HIV test in lifetime. Now, if this person between, I would say 13 and beyond 64, I don't agree 100% the cutoff in 64. So anybody who is 13 years old and older has a new partner should be tested again. Now, for those couples that they said, you know, will move forward and will become a, a couple and obviously will have sex. In that case, they have the they, they should have a test also before sex and after, but if a four test is negative, there is no much to after. But if someone has tests and this is, a, someone has sex and didn't know the status of the couple, that person should be tested. And this is something that we need to ask to our patient. Our patients that, have you had any uh, sexual, sexual encounter since the last visit with us, okay? Uh, we, have you had any risky encounters? Now, if this is established couple uh, and has been tested before, we don't have to do a test every time that uh, that person was exposed to the couple, obviously. In the case of the MSM community, 
I'm much more aggressive. And, and this, uh, I, uh, this is based on the CDC as well. The, we'll do the test every three or six months. Keep in mind that we have comp test kits. And when we do the test for HIV, please, please also do the test for STIs, okay? Because they go hand in hand. And this is the enemy that I will go very briefly here. So it's an RNA virus, it's a retrovirus. Uh, it has <clears throat> a lipid membrane. So it means that it easily dies. If you leave the virus in the environment, it disappears. What I'm telling, I'm saying here is that this virus is transmitted with blood and semen, nothing else, okay? Uh, I don't expect that the virus will be transmitted by tears, saliva, and so on, or by sitting in, in a place that is contaminated. So it's, it's blood and semen. So <clears throat> the other major component of this virus are the glycoprotein 120 and uh, GP41 uh, has some matrix and then it has a capsid with what you can say is the nucleus uh, with key enzymes that one of them is the reverse transcriptase and the integrase. Uh, this is a, in a very nutshell. Let's go over the cycle of this virus. <clears throat> so this, the, the relation size between the virus and the CD4 cells is one to 100. How on earth could be that something 100 smaller can kill that big beast that would be the CD4 cell? And it does. So this is, I would say, the product of evolution and many other forces that created this virus and this wonderful cell that the CD4 cells is fantastic. But this virus is very smart. So comes here and the GP or glycoprotein 130 binds to the CD4 and then has another receptor that is the CCR5. And these are key pieces because we can, all the steps that I'm indicating here are key steps where we can block the virus uh, integration or penetration into the cell. So after, binding to these two receptors, there is a fusion of the membrane, the virus releases the, the RNA and enzymes, and this <clears throat> RNA is uh, transformed into DNA by the reverse transcriptase, the integrase in, make the, the virus part of our DNA. And this is where our machine is start producing new virus, cis, and the virus go out immature and the proteases, the proteases that uh, make the virus mature. So we block the virus in many of these key steps, the reverse transcriptase is one. The other one is the integrase with the integrase inhibitors and the proteases, just to mention a few. But let me share briefly about the kinetics of these two players. So once the cell, the T cell is infected, the half-life is about 17 hours, okay? But in reality, the, the half-life of the CD4 cells could go to years, okay? So that tells you the depletion of our T cells that causes this virus. That's why we check and we monitor what's the CD4 cell count. Okay, now there are two types of CD4 cells infected for simplicity. Those that are active and those that are late, latently infected. In this case, this, the, the half-life goes to 44 months and is what we call the reservoir, okay? Now the HIV virions, the virions, half-life is less than one hour. So it means that when it goes from one cell to the other, it, it, it disappears in one hour. How many cells, how many no, virions are made 
a day is more than 10 billion billions. And this is a lot. So I don't know how our medicines are able to block this production. <clears throat> but the, the one important point here is that, yes, our medicine are very effective to control these cells infected, okay? But we, our, <clears throat> we are not able to get the virus here. Therefore, when we stop the antiretroviral, this become the source of the infection again. And, uh, and that's the reason why we don't have the cure of HIV. Uh, this is something, this is the, the natural history of HIV. It means the from the time of the infection to the time of death of an individual without treatment. If we have here in, in the, the the blocks or the uh, boxes, the square boxes, are uh, the CD4 cells that goes to zero to 1200. And the triangles go to 10 to the second and to the seventh uh, is the viral load. And we see the, the HIV natural history in three different segments. This is the acute, this is the latent, and this was the final stage. So in the acute, there is a drop of CD4 cells to 500, sometimes even lower, and then bounce back. Again, this is without treatment. The, the virus that has triangle goes from uh, top, that will be probably 1 million copies. And then our body put the virus down. This point here, the, the, when the virus goes down, is we call the set point. This is how strong is our immune system to control the virus. During this period, we have, we have uh, the, the patient has like, you know, a, a mono-like symptoms, uh, has a bad, bad cold. So people are coming to ER or see the doctors and if they don't pay attention, they just do, you know, the, the, the mono test the flu test, and if they are negative, I say, fine, no, you don't have any problems, you will get better. Yes, it's true, we'll get better, but we should have done also, if indicated in the risk, according to the risk behavior, you know, we should have done the HIV test. The next stage is the latent. So the individual here is walking from 12 weeks to probably eight years walking without symptoms, without symptoms. And this individual, obviously, uh, a good number of them will have sexual activity and pass the virus to others. And then at one point, <clears throat> the CD4 drops to below 200 and comes all these opportunistic diseases, not just you know tuberculosis, cryptococcosis, but also Kaposi sarcoma and lymphoma. And that it's estimated that about 11 to 15 years after this individual will die. Uh, this is, again, this is the, the natural uh, history of HIV. Uh, we have other few core concepts that uh, to, to discuss here. We learn over time that uh, the antiretroviral therapy, once it's started, it sh should be continued. It shouldn't be interrupted, okay? There was a time when our treatment was associated with significant side effects. So it was kind of saying, well, do we need to treat these individuals all the time or when the CD4 cell count is below 500, 350, or 200. So probably we should hold the treatment when the CD4 cell count is in the 500, 350. So that's what we call, you know, the we did the, the treatment according to the CD4 cell count. And that was a bad decision. So if you see here, the cumulative probability of event and that, also means opportunistic diseases 
or death. And for those that they continue with the uh, antiretroviral therapy compared with those that they do the interruption, according to the CD4 cell count, there was a, a big difference in the hazard ratio of 2.6 of having an opportunistic disease or death. Therefore, the concept is that once you start treatment, you need to continue for ever until you know we have better, better uh, uh, treatment. The next core concept is that we need to start early. So some people were saying the same. We won't interrupt the treatment, but we will start, you know, just hold it and then we'll start the treatment for a long time. And this show that also is bad. The sooner you start the treatment, the better. Uh, and what we learn uh, that we can make the virus undetectable and, and that was not in the, and the, this graphic shows clearly. In the 1970, 19, 1997, uh, there were about 20% of patients with a viral load suppressed that went up to about 96% in 2015. So it means that uh, we can make this virus undetectable and this is a good thing for our community. This is a, a new uh, guidelines about the management of HIV uh, that came in JAMA uh, this year. And I would like to review, I think two slides only. Uh, relation to the ART starting time, ideally it should be as soon as possible ideally within seven days. And uh, there was a time that we, we were saying not to treat acute HIV infection. No, we should treat acute HIV infection, okay? Uh, and then <clears throat> those cases, the, the exception are those cases who have an opportunistic infection, in particular tuberculosis, so if the patient has tuberculosis or cryptococcosis, we shouldn't start the antiretroviral therapy just there. Now we need to start the treatment for this, any of these two diseases, the tuberculosis or cryptococcosis as indicated. And then after two weeks, start the antiretroviral therapy. Uh, we are using many different medi medicines for HIV, one of the most Common is Bictarvi, that is uh, Bictegravir, uh, Tenofovir, and Emtricitabine. The other common is TVK and Discovi, that is uh, this a combination. Or we have a medicine here with just two antiretrovirals, that is Dovato, this is Dolutegravir, and Lamivudine. Uh, so we can treat uh, our patients with a pill with three medicines or a pill with two medicines. Now, if we decide to use Dovato, in that case, we need to be sure that the viral load is less than 500,000. Um, let's move to PrEP. So PrEP is pre-exposure prophylaxis and is a medicine, at, at, could be Truvada or uh, Discovi, and that is the, the name of the generic name is uh, tenofovir emtricitabine. And that if an individual who is a high risk for infection, MSM, who is sexually active with multiple partners, repeated STDs, that individual should be on PrEP. So we have studies that are shown that PrEP is highly effective in the prevention of the infection. Uh, the CDC uh, says that PrEP reduces the risk of HIV infection by about 99%. And uh, in the case of uh, drug users, injection drug users, the, the reduction is at least 74%. So I know that uh, in, in, in Kentucky, in some areas, 
we have the opioid epidemic. And so we should be active prescribing PrEP for those individuals. Uh, let me move to the next one because I think that I mentioned about this. So who should have a uh, PrEP according to the guidelines? Is, uh, are those who have anal or vaginal sex in the past six months and have one of the following, the HIV, uh, the partner is HIV positive or had a STI in the past six months or inconsistent use of condom. So those individuals should, uh, should be uh, encouraged to use PrEP. And what we are doing here is not just protecting this individual from the infection because that individual can bring five others with infection. So we need to stop the epidemic there with, with PrEP and that particular uh, patient. Uh, this is something that uh, tell us uh, the different types of PrEP by risk factor. So you have Truvada that could be daily, again, daily and on demand. So it takes you know two hours before sex, the next day and the following day. So three times. Or could be Discovy that is daily or Cabotegravir that is an injection Q2 months. So in this case, we have an, that <clears throat> Truvada is highly effective in the cisgender men and women and is highly effective in Cabotegravir as well. Uh, in the case of transgender women is also very effective independent of the type of uh, sex, uh, ex ex excluding the receptive vaginal sex. Now, keep in mind that here, we are talking about a transgender women, transgender women who, you know, at birth was, were men, okay? Drug interaction, this is something that uh, is good for, uh, internists to know, uh, be aware that if uh, they are using a protease inhibitor, uh, that could be, is one of the brand name, the, the, the generic name is ritonavir or covisistat, okay? So this, uh, there is a major drug interaction. Integrase inhibitors has the lowest drug interaction. And this is what we are using the more, the most. That's when I, I'm, indicated here about the medicines, Bictegravir, TVK, and Dovato, all of the, the, uh, the integrase inhibitor is part of any of these regimens. Uh, so pay attention to drug interactions when uh, you prescribe statins to a patient uh, with uh, HIV uh, medicines, uh, PPIs, uh, carbamazepine, and, and so on. Uh, the old NRTIs like Cydobudine, uh, Lamivudine, and less uh, a, a lower level, all are associated with mitochondrial toxicity. I saw those cases with mitochondrial toxicity uh, long, long in the past. Uh, and they are associated with lactic acidosis, uh, myopathy, cardiomyopathy, pancreatitis, and so on. Efavirenz is one of the medicines that is associated with uh, significant neuropsychiatric side effects. Uh, so in the past, you may remember a tripla uh, or sustiva, where uh, efavirenz were part of a tripla and sustiva. And uh, so if we need to pay attention about the neuropsychiatric uh, side effects on those patients taking this medicine. Uh, protease inhibitors, yes, are associated with GI side effects, but not at a high level. One important thing here uh, to keep in mind is atazanavir or reyataz, that's the, gene the brand name, reyataz, is associated with hyperbilirubinemia. Don't worry much. It's bad to see our patient with yellow eyes, but if 
for whatever reason, the insurance is pushing you that adazanavir is the only medicine that will cover. So I prefer to see that patient with yellow eyes and uh, undetectable viral load. So then at one point, you may stop the adazanavir for something better, that hyperbilirubinemia disappears. So it's something that doesn't cause parenchymal liver disease. Uh, in summary, so the HIV epidemic uh, and new cases are substantially, substantially declining. Uh, keep in mind that a lot of work and needs to be done in the South, okay? Uh, and this is one of my regions, so that's why I'm here working uh, for decades and making progress, but still, uh, it's not something that we can eliminate uh, in, in probably in a lifetime. HIV testing uh, must be used more often. I would like to repeat this 1,000 times, but I will say just once, okay? Uh, I would say that the HIV treatment is simple, is highly effective, uh, that will bring healthy lives and preventing the spread of the HIV. And PrEP is simple and highly effective for the protection of the HIV infection. Uh, thank you very much. And please let me know if any question. I open to questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Borden. This was uh, an amazing review of uh, a lot of success. Uh, and yet we're not done. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Arnold and have him handle all the questions. OK, uh, thank you very much. Uh, you've outlined kind of a history of HIV that was great, and it went from a virus where there was no treatment to one that does have treatment, where when they did get treatment, it was a handful of pills, and now it's just a pill a day or even less. Um, it was a drug that you had to go to the pharmacy for every month, and now it's mailed to your house, and it was $2,000, but now, um, you know, KDAP will pay for that HIV treatment. But what has also changed is the word on the street. So the word on the street used to be it causes AIDS, but now it's, well, there's treatment, don't worry about it. And so what can we tell our patients who don't have HIV that it's still a terrible virus, you don't want it? Uh, so what we can tell to uh, people without uh, the infection and is to uh, take a look at the community. And we are part of the community and we want health in our community. Yeah. And those who are sexually active are at risk, except that they have a stab stable long-term couple. And HIV testing is something very simple. You can do even at home. And if you ignore the HIV status, it's bad. So I think that we need to educate about HIV testing. And uh, this is the best thing that we can do and, and to remove this as a stigma. Uh, that would be very difficult. But I think that we are making progress uh, to make this stigma uh, a, a problem that is diminishing. Okay, very well. Very good. I mean, um, Jason, I'm going to look for comments. Since we're not in the room, I can't tell who has their hand up. Yeah, uh, I see <laughs> I some say, yeah, nice anyone, compliments about the lecture. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, if anyone, um, if you have questions, you can definitely unmute and ask, or if you want to post it in the uh, chat area that uh, um, please do that as well, and we'll make sure we'll, we'll read it for Dr. Bourdon. So, uh, Dr. Williams, I don't know if you had any. Um... I always do. <laughs> in, this, yeah. in this case, uh, you know, looking at the uh, ongoing healthcare disparities that are uh, ethnic, this is one of them where, uh, similar to the, as we were talking, the grand rounds I gave last week on smallpox, yellow fever, <clears throat> um, uh, polio, and then coronavirus, I was kind of remiss and not putting HIV in there had huge black-white differences uh, in mortality uh, that have been improved. 
but it, when I look at the graphs, uh, it it's like we're not we're not a hundred percent there yet. And so I I'm hoping everyone listens to what you have to say. When I looked at your you, you know we talked about the South. When you looked at your map, it looks like like Chicago and New York, L.A., San Francisco, because there are some non-Southern states that actually are above that 10 percent. Uh, and they all seem to be. So I'm thinking that it's not just South. It's more like urban, rural. And if so, isn't that an opportunity for like marketing and education and continued uh, public service announcements? I mean, what do you think we could do? And first of all, am I, am I right? It's, it's mostly urban. And if so, shouldn't we be doing something in those cities? Uh, cities like Chicago or what, what cities? Uh, yeah, looking at, uh, looking at your map. <clears throat> yeah. Um, you, you're absolutely right. It was the South, but Illinois was there. And then New York was there and California was there. And so That's I'm thinking those are big cities uh, with large populations. And it may be the black population, the MSM or the crossover between the two. I'm just wondering, you know, I, I, I see billboards on, you know, not smoking and, you know, wearing seat belts. And I, I don't see billboards in urban areas about, uh, you know, making sure they're doing Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I think that uh, this is a, a good point uh, and a good observation. Mm -hmm. uh, when we say 50% is in the South, and uh, I, when I say, you know, the, the, the darker part of the map is in the south, but there are areas, as Dr. Williams said, that you have New York, New Jersey, and Chicago. And uh, those uh, three states are uh, very crowded. And this virus is transmitted uh, by, by humans. So the more humans you have together and we interact. And, and so it's, once the virus gets into a community, it's very, very difficult to eliminate. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the South, I believe that probably, it, it, this is my imperfect observation probably. You, it's not very crowded like Chicago and New York, however, may not have all the medical uh, resources uh, like Ryan White and Medicaid to protect and to provide, to suppress the viral load or yeah. to pro pr pr provide PrEP. Therefore, you know, the, the epidemic is growing more in the South. Now, <clears throat> the, this is why Probably, you know, is rural in those in the south, and and not, uh, and, and not like in New York and Chicago, where it is you know in high, uh, I mean, crowded uh, cities. Good point. It looks like there is a question in the chat. Um, yeah, it, it's about cabotegravir ropivirine, which is the brand name is Cabanuva, and do you see that being used more and more, which is the uh, medicine you get um, every few weeks, not every day. Yes, uh, this is a game change uh, in relation to the medicine or treatment schedule. So if you think about the HIV treatment that has to be uh, daily and for lifetime, you know, it is, it's a burden for individuals. And you have to take this pill 365 days a year. Now, cab cabotegravir, Rilpivirin, that the, the brand name is uh, Cabenuba. So is one shot every two months. Okay. So those patients are coming to our clinic six times a year. Okay, so yes, they still have to get injections, but you know, it, it's kind of, uh, we are making things simpler uh, and it's according to the preference. Some people may not like the injection. So as always, you know, we bring more options. The e efficacy and safety are the same. Uh, we are not making progress in efficacy and safety. We are 
uh, making progress in availab availability of options. Yeah. Well, I hope we do conquer this virus in our lifetime, um, despite what you said. <laughs> it, but it does take somebody's whole life to uh, come to a solution and hopefully we'll get to a cure rather than just a treatment. Well, uh, if you saw those numbers, you know, that we had 165,000 uh, ca new cases a year and we are aiming for 9,000 in 2025. This is a huge difference. Yeah. Now, how long did it take? It took about 40 years. This is something that we need to analyze more. Why it took so long, something that we should have been able to do faster. Why the COVID epidemic, we were able to defeat faster, you know, in almost two years. I believe that there are many factors there that the discussion will, uh, factors that, you know, are the answers that we, we it will take too long the discussion to, to, yeah. to, to keep the, the discussion this, the, 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 this topic. Well, thank you. And um, Jason, you have a word? Yeah, um, I don't know. Would you have time for just an, another couple of questions, real quick? Or it looks like there are two good good questions. Yeah, uh, the first one is this is from uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Emmons. He's in our uh, BMT group, and he said, wants to know: Are the rising numbers and resistance patterns in countries like Russia expected to impact resistance patterns in the United States? Uh, yes. Uh, now, will depend on the how much will be the magnitude of the impact. You know, we live in a world where people can go almost anywhere too soon, and we cannot prevent we are social animals, and therefore, you know, we are open uh, to people from all around the world, and including Russia. And yes, the virus is becoming uh, quite resistant in, uh, in Russia and in other places. I would say that in the US, it, it, we are very active when we see any outbreak or, or even before the outbreak sometimes. So I will be a little bit optimistic. Uh, this is my approach, uh, but I, I'll be cautious and I'll be, I am in alert mode. All right, and real last but not least, this is from Dr. Philip May. He's one of our community uh, uh, doctors who's a free, very frequent uh, um, attendee, and I know he works with special needs uh, patients. He wants to know, does moderate or intense physical exercise, which is anti-inflammatory, have any effect on CD4 counts and or HIV? Uh, I would say that uh, any type of exercise will be good, is healthy. Uh, the patients that I see, some of them, uh, they are uh, addict to uh, body exercise and I see them stronger. And I don't believe that the exercise by itself will control the virus but is one factor of the equation to bring health. So I, I'm promoting and supporting body exercise. Uh, and that should be for all, not just for the patient with HIV infection. All well, right, so. go ahead. Sorry, Dr. Williams. No, I was just gonna um, say thank you for, for mentioning that. It's always about lifestyle. Uh, at, at this point, we better uh, sum up, but I know, Jason, you have something special. Yeah, really quick, uh, Dr. Bordone, we have a tradition here with the part of medicine recently that uh, get a little gift for our guest speakers, and uh, it's something that's very synonymous with Louisville and something I know from your time here you're probably very familiar with, so we're gonna, you're going to be receiving your very own personalized Louisville Slugger Bat. <laughs> thank you. That's fantastic. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for a wonderful presentation, uh, Dr. Williams, Dr. Arnold. You have you have any last thing in close last things in closing here? No, that's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm.
All Fantastic. right. Well, I uh, want to thank everyone again. We'll be back here next week. And uh, again, thank you, Dr. Bourdon, for that outstanding uh, presentation. And uh, we really appreciate it.